Welcome. Welcome tonight. Um, I want to introduce our speakers. Our speakers for the evening are Mr. Richard Dye. He's a professor at University of Illinois, and he is a contrarian. Um, as we know, TIFFs are really, really hot right about now, but for years he's been saying that the cities that experience the most growth actually don't have TIFFs. So I think that's pretty provocative. And then next to him we have Tom Tresser. Tom and I, we, we met, what, about three or four years ago when I was into the Olympics and really happy that they were coming. And he progressively showed me, you know, why we shouldn't support the Olympics. And then, you know, when I looked at what the Olympics could, could have potentially done to Lawndale, there was no need for him to convince me that the Olympics were not the greatest thing. And he will be sharing you, with you information about being a TIFF illuminator. And then next to him, we have Ben Jarofsky. I would say Ben and Jackie Levy, as well as John Jones. Those are three people that have taught me everything that I know about TIFFs, and now I'm dangerously informed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, to, to a fault, to a fault. So without further ado, we're going to let our speakers speak, and we'll give them each 10 minutes to give you an overview as to why we're here and, and let them share some of their propaganda as well. So we'll start with the professor, Professor Richard Dye. Hi, I'm Dick Dye, and uh, so wh why are we here? Uh, TIFF is uh, seductive. It, uh, it appears like it's free money, and it's not. Uh, it costs somebody. And uh, I've come over the years I've studied TIFF to, to, to think of TIFF as being three things. Uh, hidden taxes, hidden debt, and hidden governance. The good news for Chicago is that hidden debt is not a problem in this particular locale. It's a way that other communities get around debt limits. Uh, but hidden governance uh, is, we have the poster child here in, in this city. Uh, most of us who talk about TIFF on a national level uh, ridicule Chicago for the ineptness and, uh, and indirectness of TIFF. So I'll stop there if it's just introductory. Okay, now we will have Tom, Tom Tresser. Well, um, what I'd like to do is uh, to walk us through uh, uh, getting micro, getting into the weeds in the research that uh, the Civic Lab and the TIFF Illumination Project has done. Uh, yeah, I thought, yeah, maybe that would be smarter. She said two minutes. And Okay, I'm, 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 I'm cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead for okay, it. Go I, for I, it. So I'm, yeah. So, so let's, let, let, did I turn it back on? Yeah. Uh, uh, TIF primer. Uh, T I F. Uh, the T in TIF is, uh, the, the T in TIF is the property tax. The I in TIF is the increment in value of assessed value of properties from the establishment date of the TIF uh, until whatever current year you are collecting uh, taxes in. So for purposes of taxes, uh, tax collection, uh, TIF is a set aside, an, uh, a diversion, an earmark of property uh, taxes in two directions. The base value the time, at the time of uh, establishment of the TIF, uh, goes to the regular governments, the municipality, the school district, the county, whatever. But the, the same tax, all those tax rates applied to the increment go to this special development authority uh, that is presumably used for, uh, for economic uh, development. Uh, uh, there's rules, but the rules are really pretty much pro forma. Uh, you, if you want to, uh, you have to establish a but, you pass a but for test, but all that means with, is your consultant gives you a script and you, with a straight face, say this development wouldn't have happened except for public subsidy. It's just, it, it, it sounds like something, but it's not. Uh, uh, similarly, there's either a, a blighted or a redevelopment test, but that's a checklist that, uh, uh, well, I, I used to teach at Lake Forest College. Uh, the city of Lake Forest uh, had a TIF. 
uh, and a Ferrari dealership at that time, the Ferrari, Ferrari dealership. You know, so all you need is the right, uh, the right, the right consultants. Uh, in my uh, so it's supposed to be for economic development. In my research on TIF, the, the question is, does TIF cause property values to go up? And the, pro the hard part is cause, the but-for question. What would have happened to property values in this delineated area without the public subsidy? And that's real hard. Uh, I did not study Chicago because it's just too complicated. I'll let others, you have to study, you know, you get, I like to be at 30,000 feet and not get my hands too dirty. What I did study is, is uh, 200 plus Chicago suburbs with TIF, without TIF, before TIF, after TIF, uh, you know, doing all the appropriate statistical controls to get me into a good referee journal. But what, and what we found was that TIF moves value around. It doesn't create value. And even there's some evidence that TIF moves value around inefficiently, that we found in our first study, uh, that tax increment, fi tax increment financing uh, causes the, the total assessed value of the, of the municipality, not Chicago, but a smaller municipality, to go down. The property values outside the TIF go down more than the property values in the development area go up. That, you know, that could be anomalous, and we didn't find it in our second study, but, but we did not find the TIF uh, is associated with increased property values. And that, that's why I become a skeptic and, 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 and ha have these cautionary words for people that are excited about it. Uh, TIF is not an economic development plan. TIF is a financing mechanism. The use of TIF does not improve the development prospects of an area, does not improve the skills of the local economic development officers, nor does it make pure the motives of the local politicians. And it is a, w a way of segregating money in a particular pot to use uh, under the broad heading of, uh, uh, of economic development. But as we will learn, uh, the uses of TIF, especially in this poster child uh, of TIF shame, uh, Chicago, uh, <laughs> the, the using, you know, using it for what? It, it really just is a diversion into a pot of money that is hidden taxes and hidden, gover and hidden governance. Uh, TIF doesn't work in the most blighted areas. Uh, TIF works best in areas that are, that, that are going to develop anyhow. <laughs> And you might skew the development, but TIF can't keep property values uh, that are going down from, uh, 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 can't make, even if, even if TIF were to make property values that were going down freeze, you know, stay at the same level, there's no increment, right? So the most blighted area is, it, it doesn't work. It's most, it, it's better used by a lake forest uh, than, a, uh, than a Harvey. Uh, so uh, anyhow, uh, I, I'll, I can come back to some stuff, but but so, so but think think of this as as, as the question. I'm I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blackboard here. Uh, the frozen value at the time of TIF, whatever whatever property values are in this area, you know, ten million dollars uh, at the date uh, of the TIF establishment, and then property values grow every year. We do not know whether they would have grown anyhow. All of the value could have come from increase in property values that would have happened anyhow, in which case TIF does not create value. It just redistributes taxes in favor of these hidden governments, hidden uh, parts of government. Uh, or if you're a true believer in TIF, and there are some TIFs like this, not the sort of TIFs we have in Chicago, which are more just area-based TIFs that are speculative, uh, whatever happens, happens. Uh, will pretend to have an economic development plan. But, but in other places, a targeted TIF to a specific developer, specific area, a deal TIF, uh, could, uh, can, can be very effective, uh, can create value, can create something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, but OK, I, I will leave that and, and just state three things. Hidden taxes, hidden debt, 
and in other jurisdictions, no, hidden taxes, hidden government, and governance, and in other jurisdictions, hidden debt. Thank you very much. Um, just, I guess, pulling an example from Lawndale, um, we have a 26 in Costner TIF. Um, 10 years ago, well, about 15 years ago, it was created. 15 years later, it generated no, no value. So they did away with it and created another TIF that was just literally a block down the street. And that was um, more developer driven. And to this date, it has not driven any development. And then another example I want to give you um, based on your comment, um, you mentioned that there's no evidence that TIFs actually drive value. I remember in Lawndale, uh, right before the bubble bus, we were actually, our land values were artificially, I guess, increased, and they were increasing at a much faster rate, almost twice the rate of the city. And they still wanted to do the Ivan Pulaski TIF but for this tip, there would be no investment. But there was proof that we were already, people were already speculating, I guess, based on the Olympics and other factors. So the, there is no, no proof that these things actually work. And Lawndale looks worse now than it did um, in 2007. But I digress. Um, Tom, <laughs> we'll look at you. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks, everyone, for, for turning out uh, to talk about TIFs and um, our economic destiny in the city of Chicago. So my name is Tom Tresser. I'm an organizer, an educator, and I'm working on something called the Civic Lab, which is going to be a space for civic innovation and tool making where activists and organizers can meet designers and coders to create tools to accelerate civic engagement and useful community change. So what we have done is created something called the TIFF Illumination Project, we want to go into the weeds and ask the question, what is happening in your community? So um, what I've done is put together some slides here. So uh, the big picture, which Professor Dye has already uh, given us a, a, a good introduction, is basically uh, he mentioned the fact that the, the TIFs are created around a specific area and that inside that area where the TIF boundaries are drawn, which by the way are willy-nilly, they go all over the, the map, uh, and don't respect any particular political boundaries, uh, that the uh, value inside the TIF, uh, the, 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 uh, the property taxes generated are frozen for 23 years, and the increment, that's the amount of um, uh, value that's increased in those properties uh, once the TIF is created, are captured by the TIF district and do not go to the units of government, which is represented by that, uh, you know, like that's the... Board of Education, and the city, and the county, and the libraries, and those guys. Uh, and so that's the famous diagram that you'll see when you talk about TIFs. In the city of Chicago, we have 330 of, uh, excuse me, 163 of these puppies, uh, and another 280 in suburban Cook County. That's a total of 443 TIF districts in the county of Cook. And you see it's, they're, they're, they're all over the place. 30% of the land mass of the city of Chicago is in a TIF district. And this is, uh, this is Cook County. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, and the growth of these things has been quite uh, uh, strong over the years. This is where Mayor Daly comes into town. <laughs> and you've got a straight 45 degree angle uh, in the city of Chicago and in the county of Cook. Uh, and the value of these TIFs, the, that's how much money they have extracted, is enormous. Uh, again, um, here you have uh, the, for the, the day we have the, the, the latest information, is a $454 million in property tax extraction from the city of Chicago TIFs in one year. But if you add them all up, uh, the, uh, the total TIF takings in uh, 2011 is $729 million, ladies and gentlemen, for all the TIFs in Cook County. You know, you, you put a couple of billion here and a couple of billion there, and it starts to be a, a, a big number. And to give you the perspective, this is, you probably can't read this, but this is where the city of Chicago gets all its money uh, from 2011. And our budget was about 6.6 .6 billion. The property taxes uh, that uh, are comprised that part is about $880 million in property taxes that went into our budget. So TIFs extracted a number 
equal to 53% of all the property taxes that run the city. So, but, but, but that's on the books. This here is on the books. That's off the books. Okay, that's a key difference, as, as the professor was saying, hidden governance. Uh, and if you add up to all these numbers, since TIFs were first created, you're getting to a number of close to $5 billion. This is only up to 2011. We don't have the 2012 numbers yet, but you can put it all together, and it will be over $5 billion. Now, what I really want to talk to you about is the local picture, because really, um, it's one thing to get these big numbers for the city and the county, but you know, people live in specific communities, and Valerie was sharing her story from Lawndale. I live in Lincoln Park. You live in different parts of the city. And you may want to know, well, what does it have to do with me where I live? And that's what we're trying to, to uh, answer with the TIF Illumination Project. So just for yucks, if you said, I want to figure this out, how it's impacting me, um, I'm going to go to the city's website. Maybe I'll find an answer there. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> ben is shaking his head like he's been down that path. So you find uh, at the city's portal of uh, this page with a kind of a spreadsheety thing here that's embedded. Um, it's from a, a, a program called Socrata. But if you, if you click on that thing, you get this sort of expanded spreadsheet with has 4,588 rows. <laughs> so you can go ahead and play with that and try to make heads or tails of it and try to figure out, well, which part is it you know, relates to me, where I live, where am I on this spreadsheet? <laughs> You know, good luck with that. Um, and, then, and then if you try to figure out, like, well, how can I filter it or make it, you know, make it talk to me and make it useful so I can understand it, you have these views over here. You can't quite see what they are. Their name, there's the number of the TIF, but what isn't here is ward. <laughs> I find that very interesting because, after all, um, if I asked you, how is life in the Kinsey Industrial TIF corridor, <laughs> you know, it's like, where? That's like the Martian industrial TIF corridor. I have no idea what you're talking about. But if I say to you, how is life in the 27th ward? How is life in Lawndale? You're going to have an answer. You will have an opinion about that. And you'll, have, you know, you'll be speaking with authority. But we don't live in these TIF districts. There is no alderman for the Pulaski industrial TIF corridor. You know? There is no executive director to, to go and complain to. Um, now, I figured maybe somewhere else on the city's website, maybe I can get my question answered. So I trawled around and I found this map, <laughs> which is kind of incomprehensible, which shows TIFs for the near north side. And then you come to this page. So this is all the TIFs um, alphabetically, uh, and these are clickable uh, links. So there's 163 of these things. So you can click on each one, and you will open up a PDF. And a PDF, as you may know, is not a manipulable document. You've got to download it and look at it to see what it's telling you. And there, the pagination is screwy. This says page five, but really, you're not sure where to go to find the data. But this is the page that I'm interested in. It's the balance sheet. And it has three numbers that I think are very important for our work. The first is, how much money did this puppy take in? The revenue. That's how much property tax this thing extracted. How much did it spend? And how much was left in the bank account at the end of the year? So those are three numbers. And again, it's hard to find that on the city's website in a, in a way that's rational and easy. But anyway, um, we at, the, at the, the TIF Illumination Project opened up these 163 PDFs laboriously and started our own spreadsheet and just you know filled in the blanks one at a time, one at a time. Oh. And that's where we get this number. You don't see this number on the city's website. But at the end of 2011, if you add up all the money that was in the TIF bank accounts, you get $1.3 billion. Now, that's not crazy money. That's property taxes. That's about as basic as it gets. So as uh, David said at starting of the, of the event, it, it, it sort of gives a question to the, to the, to the frame of we're broke. And I still don't understand this, how we can be broke if all this money is sitting there. Um, maybe someone from the city will come and explain it to us. <laughs> and the question that I want to put to you that we're trying to answer in the TIF Illumination Project is, is your ward a winner or a loser? Are you coming out ahead of the game, or are you playing even, or are you behind? This graphic is from the Chicago Reporter, 
and I think Ben has reported on this extensively, that some communities are seeing a lot of money coming into the ward, some wards, not so much. And we, I think part of what we're trying to understand is what is happening here? Is there a plan? Is this by design? Just what exactly is happening? All right, so we want to look at these things on a ward-by-ward -ward basis, and so we've assembled a group of coders, investigators, and writers, and designers who are all volunteers who try to tackle this puppy. We took the 27th ward, which I think we're either in or very close to, which has 12 TIFs. We thought it was the most heavily TIFed community, but it turns out it's only number three. <laughs> <laughs> right. Only 12 TIFs doesn't even put you at the top of the list. Uh, the 27th ward is about 77% in a TIF district. Um, and here's just for you data geeks, this is the kind of data that we try to gather to answer your question, to answer this question. We needed the PIN numbers, the property index numbers, that's the unique social security number of every property. We needed to know how much money these properties paid. We needed to know uh, the distribution formulas, which is um, a little gnarly to get a hold of. We needed a shape file, that is to say the digital file of the wards and the shape file of the TIF districts. And for those uh, that you understand coding, which is not me, if you put all that together, you're able to answer the question with some degree of precision, what does the TIFs do just in my ward? That is really the magic question that we're trying to answer here. So we started with the 27th. Now you probably can't see this, but we started with the shape of the ward and then the shape of the TIFs that touch the ward. And so as I say, there are 12 TIFs in the ward and some just kiss it, so to speak. You know, just like a few percent of the, of the, of the TIF is in the ward but a few are very, very present, like 85% in the ward. So that's the first thing we found. And again, uh, you can't quite see this, but we're only interested in the pins inside the boundary and not the ones outside. With that operation, we were able to create a spreadsheet. And this is where we start to break what I think is news. We discovered that the 12 TIFs inside the 27th ward pulled out 36 million dollars, yeah, 36.8 million dollars in 2011. So that is a new number that has never been reported before. So if you live in the 27th Ward, the news to you is that those 12 TIFs extracted 30, almost 37 million dollars in one year. The next thing is that those 12 TIFs have lived side by side for nine years. So that is to say the youngest TIF is nine years old, so we perform the same operation nine times, and we get the astounding number of $255 million extracted from the ward by those TIFs in that time period. But wait, there's more. Remember we told you that, uh, that uh, the TIFs have a bank account. At the end of 2011, those 12 TIFs had $398 million. $398 million in that bank account, in their bank accounts. And what we did is perform the same operation to ask the question, what would happen if you sunsetted all those TIFs on January 1st, 2012, and sent that money back to whence it came, so to speak, if you could imagine that. And if you had done that, the people of the 27th Ward would have had a bank account, so to speak, of 60 $2 million. So $62 million of that, uh, of that unspent money belonged, quote unquote, to the 27th Ward. $62 million. So if you're from the Ward and you have a list of issues or wishes or desires, uh, I bet you didn't know you had $62 million sitting mm -hmm. in the bank accounts. And that's what these show. Um, our research also showed us who's got TIFs in their ward by what percentage. And so we can tell you uh, with some precision, you know, here's how many TIFs are in your ward and here's how big they are, you know, whether they are largely present or just, you know, just touching your ward a little bit. Uh, here's your top 10 TIF wards. Number one is the 24th ward. <laughs> <laughs> you, Valerie, you're the winner with 86% of your ward in a TIF, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Step right up and claim your prize. <laughs> Number two is the third ward, Pat Dowell Alderman, with 82%. And number three, the ward that we're looking at, the 27th Alderman, Walter Burnett, 
with 77% uh, of the ward in a TIF. Um, only one ward has no TIF in it whatsoever, and that's the 41st, which is mostly O'Hare. But everybody else has you know, something in their ward to, to uh, look at. Um, now, we also were able to tell you how much property tax was paid by each ward. And so here is the uh, 27th ward right here. It's about $111 million, all paid in, uh, in property taxes in 2011. Now, this is a significant number, and bear with me, because this is what we're told our property taxes pay for. And Ben has been writing about this, <laughs> and, and, and really this is where I've you know, gone to school. Um, Supposedly, your property taxes get broken out in the city of Chicago so that the Board of Ed gets about 54%. And then you can see the other guys. The Park District gets so much. The city, of course, gets about 21%, and so forth. So these guys have a claim on your property tax. Now, myself, my wife and I, we have no children, but we're, no, we're, we're okay with, with that money going to the, to the Board of Ed because my mother was a public school teacher. My wife, Merle, was a public school teacher. I was on the LSC, you know, for my community. And it's just something we believe in deeply that that's what makes, you know, America great. And public education is kind of like, you know, how the middle class got created and, you know, all those things that you were taught in, you know, civics. So public education, good thing, good thing. And we don't mind paying for it, except when the TIF comes to town, it gets a little screwy. So this spreadsheet now tells us what happens in the 27th Ward once the TIFs are present. So this chart right here is the, 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 the ideal chart. TIFs get 0%, and the other pieces of uh, the city get what they're supposed to get. There's that $111 million. That's the property tax. So this column right here is how it should be, with the Board of Education getting 54% of this number, which would be about $60 million and change. That's what you're told in the civics book. <laughs> Except we've demonstrated to you that the, 30, the 27th Ward has already paid about $36 million in, in TIF money. So that $36 million comes off the top. It's kind of like Vegas, right? <laughs> I don't know, maybe you can, you can, you can correct me on this, but, but you know, if the mob is running the casino, <laughs> and you had a $1,000 night in the casino, right? And you send 900 back to the owners in Chicago, but the mob keeps 100, the owners think, hey, we had a great night, 900 bucks. But they don't know that the mob took 100. That's kind of what happens here. The TIF takes it off the top, and then everybody else gets what's left. So take that $36 million out, and now you have the true dis distribution of, from the 27th Ward to those bodies of government. So notice over here what happened to the Board of Ed. Instead of getting 60 million in change, they only got 40.4, wow. okay? Now, this is just one ward out of 50, okay? So this operation has to be performed 49 <laughs> more times to get the full story, but at least you're starting to get the picture. So, remember, this is the true distribution of property taxes with the TIFs taking this much money. Wow. And the Board of Ed getting this much money. Now, this is, that's what it was supposed to be. You know, that's what they have in, in the civics text with the Board of Ed getting all this. <laughs> Instead, they get this. This is just from one ward, as I say, uh, after you take out the 36 mil that goes to TIFFs. All right, well, we try to figure the, uh, out a way to, to explain this, and so everyone has one of these puppies. It was designed by Carolyn So, who's right in the front row. Carolyn, say a big, a, big, a big lot of love to this designer and to all the coders who worked on the data underneath it, whose names um, uh, they, I can't go into. They would prefer me not to, to <laughs> say. But, what, the, what we're trying to experiment with is, does this tell the story? And I, we'll be asking for your feedback later. Uh, you know, we want to know, is this telling the story in a good way? Can we do a better job of it? Um, but this is what we've come up with. Um, so there's two sides of it. What, the first side is the money going out. The other side is money coming in. Because TIFs do pay for things in the ward. The question is, how does it balance? So we filed a FOIA to the city. 
and we asked, please tell us all things funded by TIFs in the 27th Ward, regardless of the city agency. We want to tell a true story here. So if there's fantastic work going on in the ward, funded by TIFs, please tell us, and we would, we would report it. This is what we got back, a flyer. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, from, uh, from the Alderman Walter Burnett's website, um, saying, you know, here's the stuff we've done. And also, um, they gave us a disc with a lot of the redevelopment agreements. So you can print those out and <laughs> make heads or tails of it. <laughs> so this is the city responding to our attempt to try to figure this <laughs> stuff out. Well, unfortunately uh, for them, or fortunately for us, through our networking, someone came forward with a list of projects funded by TIFs in this ward. And so we have this data, which is what's fueling uh, this part of the, of the map. And here are the projects funded by TIFs. All this is going to be on our website uh, starting in the next few days. And what this shows, basically, is that for all the money that's come back into this ward, 42% of it was for public use, for the Board of Education mostly. And 58% was for private use, including $8 million for Blommer chocolate. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a great smell, and I, you know, I love chocolate. My wife will tell you I love chocolate. But is it worth $8 million to the people of this 27th Ward? Also, um, H2O Plus, a million dollars. The um, uh, Mariano's Fresh Grocery, seven million dollars. Uh, and uh, Jewel Food Stores, four million, and, and on it goes. Wow. So it, it raises the question of what is the economic reasoning for giving these companies tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars? And do the people of the 27th Ward know, did they have a say in how this money was distributed. The other thing that's problematic is the money that's being spent on public education for the buildings cannot be spent on teachers. So it might be that the people of the 27th Ward might want more teachers, or they might want more library books, or they might want more parks, or something of that nature, or more, or more park district uh, counselors, or things of that nature. Well, they don't get a say. Uh, and so um, we do know that Board of Education does fund uh, private schools through TIFs, and uh, uh, of, the, of the research that's been done, 48% of TIF money that goes to public school education, or uh, Board of Education, education uh, construction, is for public schools, and 52% of the money that the Board of Education is using TIF money for is for private schools, charter schools, selective enrollment schools. So that's another problem that I'm sure the people of the 27th Ward would like to know about. <laughs> anyway, to sum up, it's very difficult, or if not impossible, to find out how these things impact your ward. So we went on this data hunt. Uh, we showed you that they extracted about $37 million in property taxes in 2011. We showed you that that was 33% of all the property taxes collected in the ward. We showed you that 12 TIFs extracted $255 million over the past nine years. We showed you that $62 million from the 27th Ward was sitting in TIF accounts at the end of the 2011 year. And of the money that comes back into the ward uh, from TIFs, only 42% went to public projects, but 58% went to private commercial, including um, the Hellenic Museum, by the way, for three and a half million. Um, and we lack details on, on, on b b about all this stuff. So it was really, we, don't, we don't really have the details to tell you, you know, what a lot of these things are. Uh, it's, a, it's a statewide project in Illinois. There's 455 of the municipalities. I have 120, 1,220 TIF districts. Um, and a lot, about half of them are out of compliance. And so the people that live in those communities have no idea what the TIFs are doing. So uh, we are calling on you to be TIFF illuminators. We're going to have a workshop later, uh, but you can email me at tom at civiclab.us. We have an online petition where we're urging the state to put TIFFs on our property tax bills, because if they can collect it, they should be able to report it. <laughs> and uh, that's it. So um, I, I think I went a little over my time, but we wanted to get all this information out. So thank you very much. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Tom.
I don't know. I, I think it'll be really interesting, too, to see once people join the Illum Illuminator project to see what their own numbers are. I have a feeling that Lawndale will um, have a, a much different story to tell. Um, there are some TIFs where up to 88% of the, the funds collected were going to a TIF and not um, to the general, um, general fund. So that'll be really interesting. So without further ado, we're going to bring Ben Jarofsky. Well, um, thank you for having me uh, to this, uh, this show, the TIFF show. And um, Tom and uh, Professor Dai, you guys were fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been obsessed with TIFFs for so long now, it's almost embarrassing to talk about. And um, I still get dragged out or invited, I shouldn't say dragged out, uh, to come talk about TIFFs all the time. And I'm sort of thinking maybe at this stage of my life I'd like to diversify uh, <laughs> what I'm known for, but um, I'm afraid I am now anchored to this issue. Uh, and uh, it's at the point now where when I see people, I remember when I had like our first TIFF conversation <laughs> and uh, Valerie, <laughs> I remember it very well a in a that's Starbucks now <laughs> that's now closed. I believe it was funny with the TIFF or was the movie theater <laughs> next to it? Yeah, <laughs> movie theater. <laughs> All closed, and uh, it was Valerie, me, and there was another person, Joanne Bradley. Joanne Bradley. And uh, my memory is that I was coming on a bit strong uh, <laughs> and getting red in the face and talking with my arms, and as I generally do when I start talking about tiffs. And I thought the two of them were looking at me like, oh, "This guy is really weird," and let's end this conversation uh, because what I've discovered through this years and years of obsession with this program, it is that it is truly one of the great scams ever perpetrated. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's ongoing. Um, uh, it uh, doesn't seem to show, well, no, I'll get it before I say that. Uh, it is slowing down a bit. Um, it's being managed, I would say. Now I'm talking in, in uh, very specific terms here. I'm talking about the TIF program as it's operated in Chicago. Professor Dye was talking about uh, TIFs as an abstract tool of economic development, which is a completely different um, animal than the way TIFs have been used in the city of Chicago. Uh, in the abstract, which is where we don't live, uh, a TIF is a way uh, to finance a project that, but for that TIF would not be, uh, would not occur. So essentially what you're doing is you're uh, borrowing uh, property taxes that would otherwise go to the schools and the parks, et cetera, and they're using that money to finance one specific project, uh, let's say a, a vacant lot, that would um, blossom into a tax producing project that would then pay back the schools and the parks, et cetera. So you have to think of it as an investment that all these different taxing bodies make in an undeveloped uh, plot of land. And if it's a shrewd and wise investment, then they can take a piece of property that's under producing, not producing any taxes in some cases, and turn it around so that it has a greater yield and thus everybody benefits. That is the principle of TIF in the abstract. And again, we don't live in the abstract. We live in the city of Chicago. And at some point in the 1990s, um, I think it was someone in the mayor's office figured out what, you know, if you, if you just slap the TIFs anywhere you want and have no specific uh, goal for any of them, just have money pour in, then you would have a ceaseless source of money that was the mayor and the mayor's alone to, to play with. Uh, and at one point, uh, when the economy, when the real estate market was strong, remember these are property taxes, so it's, um, they're related to uh, the uh, state of the real estate industry. When the real estate market was strong, it was um, well over $500 million that was pouring in. Um, and it's essentially a tax that we all pay. Um, this is a really important point that I never tire 
of making, particularly when I get my property tax bill, which I just received and paid a few weeks ago. Uh, as Tom was saying in that illustration, um, according to the records, uh, the numbers are rough in my mind, but the, six, the 27th Ward supposedly pays the Board of Education $60 million, let's say, and in fact, uh, 20 million of that goes to the TIF, so they only get 40 million. Well, to compensate for the 20 million dollars that the Board of Ed is not getting in this example, they have to raise the tax rates across the board so that everybody in the city of Chicago is effectively paying more money to in their property taxes to compensate for the 20 million dollars that the Board of Ed is not getting from the 27th Ward. So it is a tax increase citywide. And that is perhaps, of all the problems with the TIF program, and there are so many, as, as Tom and uh, Professor Dye pointed out, but of all the problems, there's this just uh, gross uh, inequity where the 27th Ward is the beneficiary of property tax increases that all of us are paying, and yet that money can only be spent in the 27th Ward. So we could just add that to the long and flowing list of things that are wrong with this program, which should be abolished immediately. Uh, having said that, I'd like to say that we have made some progress uh, on the TIF scam in Chicago, and I'll put it this way. I think that um, as a result of eight years of any different people banging their head against the wall trying to uh, get people to uh, pay attention, uh, we've now successfully uh, turned those three letters, T-I-F, into something that the general public knows is bad, B-A-D. And, um, <laughs> and that's the most basic equation, and uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel uh, even though he had been largely absent from the city of Chicago uh, for the last 10 years before the people of Chicago decided to elect him as their mayor, um, he's a very f quick study and he realized that um, it was probably not a good thing to just keep uh, the TIF program alive the way Mayor Daley did. So what he did was he proclaimed himself a reformer of the TIF program and um, he uh, impaneled a group of uh, advisors to study the TIF program, and then they produced a report, and as soon as that report was produced, he said, we've reformed the TIF program. <laughs> and uh, since most people in Chicago really don't pay attention to these things and these details, that was good enough for them. He got favorable editorials, I believe, in both mainstream papers <laughs> for reforming the program that he didn't reform. Um, but I happen to say that um, he has shown restraint, um, even though it's a fake reform. Um, he hasn't really reformed the program at all. He hasn't created any new TIF districts, as far as I know of, in this two years, year and a half. So uh, that's progress. Um, and um, he hasn't uh, dedicated a good chunk of the money to any particularly harebrained scheme, uh, which is more progress. Um, there's been a few expenditures he's had that um, are doubtful. The one I keep harping on uh, with roughly $30 million to build a um, upscale skyscraper office building uh, in what is it, River North, which is one of the wealthiest uh, areas of Chicago. Don't quite see how that is really um, helping uh, truly blighted communities. But um, compared to Mayor Daley, he's been uh, much more uh, restrained. Now, I don't know if that means uh, he just hasn't figured out how he intends to spend that pool of money that is sitting there that is virtually his alone to spend, or if he just hasn't figured out how to spin whatever his attentions are in a, <laughs> a, in a, in a, in a way that will bamboozle the public, <laughs> which is not that hard to bamboozle. So, um, but I do take that as a sign of progress um, that he has not, again, created any new TIF districts and he is not uh, uh, spending a huge chunk of money uh, besides the 29.5 million and the grocery store in Greektown and the grocery store in North Center. And there's a few smaller things. I suppose they do add up, so maybe I'm being too kind to him. I'm really trying to be nice and uh, 
fair-minded, et cetera, et cetera, as I get older. So um, that's sort of the state of the TIF scam uh, as we see it right now. We're sort of in a holding pattern. Uh, the, the mayor and the powers that be understand that you, the public, um, realize um, that it is a bad program, putting it uh, the bluntest way, that it is a scam, uh, and that it, somehow or other it does divert from uh, the schools and the parks, and that somehow or other there is this inherent contradiction that Professor Dye and Tom were talking about, and Valerie was talking about, where um, we're supposedly broke, and yet there's all this money sitting in a bank account uh, that we don't have access to. And so I think that's where we are right now, um, where the general public has a vague understanding of what's going on, and that's a good enough understanding to have momentarily blocked Mayor Rahm Emanuel from sort of, uh, you know, scooping up the money and spending it on something that we'd rather not have him spend it on, which is what I think Mayor Daley would have done had that Olympics, yeah, which is what I think... Yeah, no, they thought I was crazy, and I was being like, oh, he's got all these millions in the thing, and he's going to spend it on the Olympics. <laughs> they, they resisted. They resisted because they're Chicagoans, and they're just so used to loving their government so much. So, um, so really, you know, my problem is not with the mayor for uh, perpetrating such scams. My problem is always with the, my fellow citizens of the city of Chicago who allow this to happen year after year, or keep electing the same people, keep expecting the results to be different. Uh, as I get older, I just become more and more frustrated with my fellow citizens, most of whom are, I'm pretty sure are tired of hearing me say this. So anyway, with that, we'll take it. I'll give it back to Valerie and move on. Okay, awesome. Let's give our speakers a hand. We're now at the question and answer period. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write them down. I, I believe there are index cards that are going around. And if there are any questions that you'd... Also, a, a couple, we, mm -hmm. we'd really like it if you, would, if you write your name on it, then you can actually come down and ask your question. If you just wrote your question, I guess Valerie will have to read it. But um, v Valerie likes community engagement, so we'd really like to hear from you. So please write your name on it, and then you can actually speak. Um, and we have, I have the first round of them. So you can see that this is Dr. Laura Chamberlain. Oh. So try to find the names. That okay. Can. All right. Great. Okay. We'll get you some more. Okay, Dr. Chamberlain, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> the price is right. The price is right. Exactly. If we're going to get rid of this, which I think strongly we should, who should we go to to get rid of it? The state, the city? Like, what? what what's the plan to end the TIFs? Uh, well, there's two levels um, of answering that question. The obvious one is, well, the state writes the law that governs the TIF. So I've been, you know, if you want the TIFs to be changed, the fastest and easiest way to do that is to convince your state reps and your state senators to vote for some kind of TIF reform. That it's within their power, it's within their jurisdiction. I will warn you that you will be met with fierce resistance um, and you will give it a lot of double talk. I remember in 2006, the Cook County Board of Commissioners entertained the notion of putting the TIF tax tax on the property tax uh, and um, Mayor Daley sent over a horde of aldermen uh, to advocate strongly against that, including uh, Walter Burnett of the 27th Ward and Helen Schiller from then the 46th Ward, uh, then of the 46th Ward. And um, they successfully convinced the Board of Commissioners to bury this proposal to put the, the TIF take on the tax bill on the grounds, as one commissioner, Larry Suffernan, said, it would just confuse the property taxpayers as if they're not confused already. So uh, that would be the first uh, way to do it. And the second obvious way is to um, uh, have elect aldermen and a mayor who would abolish the program. Um, and th on that front, it was very frustrating. I, I have to say the last election, 2011, was the first time I heard aldermen uh, talking strongly about um, reforming the TIF program. And then, of course, um, nothing ever happens. They come into... Yes. So, 
Uh, I would say of the two prospects, well, they're both pretty bleak, but uh, I'd say the former is probably the best. I don't know. What do you think, Tom? Well, f speaking for the, the TIF Illumination Project, what we want to do is go to all 49 wards and gin up the same story and, and let the people decide in each ward uh, what they want to do. And then we want to go to every township in Cook County. There's about uh, 86 townships that have TIFs and put this information before them. Yeah, it would have to be a state law for any kind of reform. Uh, but I can say the, the one thing that we do want right now, and I think everyone could get behind this, is simply put the, taf the TIF taking on your property tax bill. So that would be a state law. You could love TIFs, you could hate TIFs. You could be conservative, you could be liberal, doesn't matter. Just It's good information, you know. America was founded on the taxation without representation tip, right? So just put it on the tax bill. So that would be my request to the to the group tonight. Just let's do that. Did you want to respond? Okay, I'm going to call a few people now. Um, Anita Orlikoff, Jason Rico, I believe, Don McGregor, and Jackson Potter. So just because David's my son doesn't mean it's rigged that I got called second. This is Chicago. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to question whether there really aren't any new TIFs, because in the fourth ward, where they had the TIF for the Hyatt Hotel, we were told in our local newspapers that that was predicted to take all of the TIF money for the district, so there wouldn't be anything left over to wipe out the uh, low-end grocery store and replace it with a Whole Foods that we probably can't uh, support because we already have a Treasure Island, so one of them is going to disappear. So I don't really see how that's good. And so they are in the process, somewhere along the line, of creating a new TIF. I don't know. The, yeah, the Hyatt Hotel TIF, I could go on and on about these things. I'm really going to try to have some restraint here. The Hyatt Hotel TIF's been, what a debacle that thing is. Anyway, that, that was, that's that been around for a long time. It was supposed to uh, be used for neighborhood investment along, what street is that? Is that 55th Street? 53rd Street? Yeah, it was good. well, it was supposed to be for all the little shops along 53rd Street, and somehow or other, it ends up all going to build this development for the University of Chicago and Hyatt Hotel. It's amazing how that works. So, um, and then there's that second TIF just north of that, uh, which I think is cut off from another TIF, which is, so, um, whatever. Uh, they're both debacles, and um, it's a complete waste of money, in my humble opinion. Okay, I have a sli slightly wonky question here, but can funds from one TIF district be transferred to another? And if so, do they have to be adjacent TIF districts or uh, say, can if the Peterson-Pulaski TIF up on the depressed area of Sauganush uh, doesn't, doesn't have enough money, can, can they port it from, I don't know, Six Corners or something like that? Or, and if so, why? Yeah, how much? Yeah. As originally written, you couldn't transfer TIF money, but Chicago wanted to do it, so the law was rewritten. <laughs> okay, is Jackson Potter here? Thank you. Um, as somebody who was arrested at a TIF site, Grossinger Auto, to bring attention to how just outrageous these things are, um, I would say you're no longer the Lone Ranger, Ben. That part of the reason Rom is so scared of these things isn't because he's just a do-gooder or reads the paper more but because citizen action is exposing just how you know, terrible and unfair and inequitable they are. So I, I guess beyond just re-electing politicians, what are things we can do, like maybe taking a golden toilet to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange? You know, they gave back $15 million. So did United Airlines. Um, they said they weren't going to take that money to renovate their toilets after we did bake sales for them. I mean, there, there's something happening here. 
And so I guess beyond just you know, throwing the bums out, it seems like we have a lot of power to influence this policy. Uh, yes, Jackson, I remember when you were arrested. I, was, I felt responsible for that uh, <laughs> somehow. I remember calling you afterwards. Please, don't hold me accountable for it. Um, but uh, I, I do believe uh, I, t I tend to I tend to be very uh, pessimistic uh, by nature, uh, but I do believe that there are signs of optimism. Just the fact that there's all these people in a room talking about TIFFs and everybody I think fundamentally understands it and is a great sign. Uh, the Chicago Teachers Union, this current group, as opposed to the the teacher union groups that I used to be begging to champion the issue in the <laughs> the 90s and the O's, uh, really has uh, aggressively promoted uh, the TIFs, uh, largely because so much it diverts so much money from our public schools, which are supposedly broke. As a precursor to really citizen activism for the 2015 elections. So let's educate ourselves and our neighbors about these issues, and let's, let's you know, rip the wool off the eyes, uh, those that say these programs are, are to our benefit. So let's really just show them what's happening and maybe uh, we can get to the place where we have, you know, 100,000 people in the city of Chicago debating over the budget, you know, on a yearly basis. You know, it happens in other countries. Okay, we have some anonymous questions. Um, if you want to be associated with the question, please come on down if you want to kind of fill in some of the, the blanks. Um, this is a very good question. Who makes the decisions about where TIF dollars go? What decision-making bodies or individuals do TIF funding requests go before? Who are these nameless, faceless people, I, I guess? Is there anyone who wants to, to own this question and, and maybe expound? Okay. It, okay, that was the gist of it. Do you want to come down and make yourself known? Okay, now um, to the best of my knowledge, and people here can correct me, um, it's the mayor who makes the decision. The mayor and I guess after the fact, the alderman would actually have some, some input. And then what decision-making bodies or individuals, you know, again, that would be the mayor and the budget office, um, to a degree, the alderman. What we've been pushing in Lawndale is for TIF advisory councils where there's some shared responsibility. And what I like about what's going on um, in Alderman Joe Moore's ward, they uh, actually have uh, participatory budgeting where people you know, at least have some input in the menu process, but I think that that can be transferred to the TIFs. And um, I like what's going on in the fourth ward, um, started by, I, I believe the process was started by Tony Preckwinkle. She actually has a TIF advisory council in addition to another preservation council where any projects are vetted publicly. You know, that, that's a, a big difference. You know, she, when she was alderman, she made sure that those projects were vetted publicly before this council, and they would have to say yay or nay or um, have people go back, you know, to do some more work before she would sign off. And I would love to see something like that in every ward or every neighborhood, you know, where people or citizens are actually vetting the projects that they're paying for rather than, you know, you wake up one morning and you see a bull, bulldozer across the street. Okay. Well, I just would add one, one thing to though. <laughs> the, the, the other thing that you got to keep in mind is if the city only has so much money, what's the smartest move to push broad-based grassroots economic prosperity for the future of the city? Is it by spiffing businesses to do what they're going to do anyway? Okay? <laughs> so the Hyatt Hotel has is, is been mentioned several times as an egregious example. You know, it's own, the property is owned by a billionaire, the University of Chicago, and the developer is the Hyatt Hotels, a billionaire. And they're getting five million and change to build a project that's probably going to sell out, you know, and be very successful. So I don't understand the rationale for that. So what's a better way to envision the future of your city? You know, d d is there a process? I, I don't know, but, but could the people of the city of Chicago get together and say, 
you know what, the smartest way for the city to prosper in this era of the brain is to make sure all our kids graduate safely from high school, able to read at, at or above grade level. How about that as a breathtaking example of, to make us a world-class city? Right now we're graduating like 52% and most, you know, a lot of them are not ready to take their place in the economy. So let's graduate smart, the world-class smart kids who, who corporations will come and fight for you know, the right to be here to, to employ them rather than trying to figure out a winner or loser like let's give money to Grossinger Auto for no particular reason. I think those are some of the larger questions that the city should entertain. I, I just to specify uh, the question regarding uh, who, what, over, what boards oversee this, uh, Valerie is absolutely correct that ultimately it's the mayor's decision. Uh, the way w we've set up things in Chicago, the mayor is an all-powerful mayor, first daily, then Rahm. Um, but there are oversight boards that, are, that act like rubber stamps along the way. And I'm thinking if you want to sort of wed movements, there's a movement in Chicago right now for an elected school board. Um, one of the groups that oversees TIFs, you cannot have a TIF district created without a body called the Joint Review Board approving it. And the Joint Review Board consists of representatives of the various taxing bodies who are losing money to the TIFs. One of which, obviously the biggest one, is the Chicago Board of Education, the Chicago Public Schools. So. All these years um, that uh, people have been criticizing the TIFs, I've been writing about the TIFs, the Chicago School Board has been uh, embarrassingly silent uh, as millions and millions of dollars get diverted from their coffers to the slush fund and then they're closing schools and they're cutting back raises and they're t converting schools into charters who pay their teachers less and they're losing, the, while they're losing this money. I would like to think that um, if we ever got to an elected school board, if we just one person on that elected school board who would speak up and criticize and maybe say, no, I, this TIF is not serving a, a reasonable purpose, we should um, get rid of this TIF, let it, let it die, or I'm gonna vote against the creation of this new TIF. I think that that's one aspect where we could have some oversight um, uh, on, on this program that we don't have now. Uh, before I call the other two people, I just wanted to co you know, comment on what you were saying. The thing that bothers me about the current Board of Education, they have power going all the way up to the White House. You know, th that's how extensive their power is, probably even international in some cases, but they won't go to Springfield and actually advocate for better policies. You know, a simple policy like returning the excess funds, you know, to the Board of Ed, that, that would go a long way, but I, I digress. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I do a lot of that. You should never have given me the mic. <laughs> okay, Connie Ma and Donna, are you in the house still? Connie and Donna, can you come down? Maybe say a little about the question if it's, a, if it's not Donna. Okay. Um. I think it's Donna, but it's um, someone who lives in Washington Park Community, 20th Ward. Would you like to ask your question down here? Just read it. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. Okay, I live in the Washington Park Community in the 20th Ward. The proposed TIF was canceled and we didn't know why. Now the TIF is going to be reintroduced. How can we as a community get more answers and transparency? Donna, um, who wants to take that? The, you're talking about the TIF. I thought that TIF did pass. There's, I may have to amend. Uh, if you're telling me that there was a new TIF that's coming on, then I guess I have to amend what I said, that there haven't been any new TIFs created. But Rob, if my understanding is that there was the uh, TIF created in the 20th Ward, which I, of course, believe was all about the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alderman Cochran's TIF was from 2009, yeah. I think mm -hmm. it was, around there. Okay. And then, of course, we didn't get the Olympics, so then the issue became, well, what are you going to use this, this TIF for? That's my understanding of it uh, in the particulars. Now, if there's another TIF, I just don't know about it. Uh, but uh, again, this entire process from start to finish is essentially controlled by the mayor's office. So if you're trying to get information uh, about a TIF, you're dealing 
it's not as though you're going to go to sort of an objective source that's going to give you a, a, a fair-minded analysis of the pros and cons. Uh, as I've written about many times before, the source that you're going to for your information is usually giving you erroneous information that's designed to fool you into thinking that it's not a property tax hike when it is a property tax hike, that it doesn't divert money from the public schools, when of course it does divert money from the public schools. So you're really at a loss uh, if you're trying to find uh, an official body that will give you the straight dope, so to speak, about a TIF. And that's why it's really important, I think, what Tom and other citizen activists are doing. They're setting up uh, a resource to uh, fill a vacuum, so to speak. Tom, did you want to? Well, I think uh, when we are few at the finish with the Q&A, we're going to do some breakout sessions, and one of them is about organizing. So if you've got some ideas about bringing power and, and, and influence and new thinking to this issue, that's the session you should go to. I mean, some things have already been done, like that's been demonstrated, like embarrassing the, the TIF takers. Uh, we're coming up with this tool to inform people. So I'll be doing a session on TIF illumination. There'll be a session on, uh, on participatory budgeting, and there'll be a session on organizing. So you know, this is the time for us to come together and put our collective minds to this project and not accept the status quo. And if we can imagine a better uh, way to do things, then we should move in that direction and make it so. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Connie. Um, I live in Pelson, and I learned first about TIFFs a uh, few months ago when I did my final paper on um, TIFFs in my public policy class. Um, one of the details I wanted to mention to um, kind of augment what these gentlemen have been saying is um, one thing about the money that, you know, would, be, would have been allotted to education because of um, the their home rule status, which is kind of a, a policy um, term. Um, schools, um, the, you know, City College of Chicago and the Chicago Board of Education aren't actually going to be able to access the, the, that large amount of money. Um, what would have happened is the tax rate would have gone down and everyone would have paid a little bit less. And so I just wanted to point out that's one of the kind of nuances, but it's a, it's a very deep issue. And I really encourage everyone to look for it on their own because just on my own, I was able to find an enormous amount of detail about it. Um, I did want to kind of ask a question and encourage um, everyone to think about as well as solicit some suggestions on um, the fact that, you know, TIF is a flawed, infinitely flawed uh, means to a very important end, which is real economic um, development that's very much needed in the city of Chicago. Um, so how, how can we actually do that? And what from TIF could we learn that would be you know, actually useful? In other words, what's the alternative to TIF? Thank you. Well, uh, I was sort of getting at this when I said earlier, so I'll kind of go back to it um, again. The, the idea that, as um, Professor Dye was saying, where you use property tax dollars at the moment to make a very sh strategic investment in one particular project so that project will generate more taxes makes sense. So I don't, again, on the very abstract level, as a strategy of economic development, I don't have any strong objection uh, to TIFFs. The way, but it's how they're used in Chicago and what they have turned into Chicago that um, uh, we have to be really concerned about. So those are really two important distinct questions. One, what do you do to stimulate economic development in low-income communities where uh, private development won't go? And that's a very difficult and challenging question. But that has absolutely nothing to do with the way we run the TIF program in the city of Chicago now, where they set up these TIF districts and communities that are not blighted, that are not low income, that don't need assistance for development. And as a result, we have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into a slush fund every year. So those are two very important points that I think um, you should keep in mind that the strategy of of uh, subsidizing development in low-income communities that desperately need development 
is far different than what the TIF program is in the city of Chicago. Well, yeah, it's, it's how it was intended to be. I mean, if, if it had any rules at all, I would say. <laughs> in other words, if, if, if it was done the way it was supposed to be done, you would have very defined projects. There's just the notion of using TIF dollars. I can really watch myself because I can go on and on <laughs> about this. Just the notion of using TIF dollars for public, to build public schools is a deviation from what a TIF right. is supposed to be. And so like this notion that, well, it's not so bad because m the money went to a public project. I, I, have, I, I have problems with that. <laughs> You're supposed to use TIF dollars to generate more property tax dollars. You're supposed to use it as a shrewd and wise and strategic economic development investment so that you bring more property tax dollars in. If you use TIF dollars to build a public school, you're not directly bringing in new property tax dollars to offset the property tax dollars that you spent to build the school. So now you could say in a long range term, well, it's good and strong for a neighborhood to have a public school, a nice new public school. So indirectly, there's a benefit, but you can't do a direct benefit like you're a, an investor. Like imagine if you were a strategic and smart investor and you're gonna say, I'm gonna take this $10 that I have here and I'm, I'm gonna invest it so I know that I can bring back $5 from that. That's not how we do the program here. So. I really do believe, I'm curious to see what Professor Dye says about this, because he studied this in terms of the specific economic development aspect of the program. I believe that if we are going to use TIF strategies in Chicago, we have to be very specific. We have to use, we have to define exactly what it is that we're investing the money in, and we have to end the TIF district as soon, in my humble opinion, as that investment has produced whatever we said we're building. And that's when Mayor Washington created the first TIF. If you go read the TIF study that uh, accompanied it, he said, as soon as, what is it, Block 37 is developed. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it's developed, we will end this TIF and let all those monies flow back to the taxing bodies because we appreciate them essentially lending us the monies. Somehow or other, Everybody forgot what <laughs> Mayor Washington said back in 1984, and we turned this into this monstrosity that we have. Uh, you know, conceptually, it, it's the politics that's hard. But, but yes, TIF should be much more constrained. As you know, take it on, on its face as to what it should be, and write the rules as to how the decision is made and how the monies can be spent to that uh, to that end. Uh, but you know, Chicago is just is just nuts. Let me let me make uh, <laughs> the, 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 uh, young woman made the made the point that uh, I get to say young woman to everybody. But uh, the young woman, she made the point that that uh, TIF and education is nuanced. Uh, here's okay. I don't live in Chicago. Uh, Chicago is stealing education money from the rest of the state. Because the state aid formula gives money inverse to how much property tax per pupil you have. Wow. And the property tax for that purpose is defined as what's available to the school district and the TIF monies aren't available, therefore Chicago gets more. That's right. And so when they then give it back to the school, it isn't counted as you know, available. Uh, Chicago does that. As somebody who doesn't live in Chicago, I think that's outrageous. But uh, you know, R Rosemont has refined that to an art. <laughs> they yeah. they so chiff. I, they I, give the money back to the school district. The state pours in money that wouldn't have poured in before. I, we got a call from a, a school superintendent in the suburbs on this very point, and what he pointed out was that look, the state is all, has only set aside a certain amount of money for state aid to, 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 to education. Right, so if, if, the, if, the, if the state legislature has put a billion dollars or whatever the number is that's available for state aid to the schools and you and these 1,220 TIFs are throwing a monkey wrench in and querying the deal uh, for the rest of us uh, by taking money off the table, they're, they're moving money from other parts of the state to cover their bet, so to speak. And so that billion dollars has to go further and, and what the professor is saying is those folks who don't have TIFs 
are then sending their school money to those that do, and that is not fair either. So, um, and there's some school districts that ha have sort of a flat deal where they, where they don't get this, uh, uh, this formula. They sort of get what they get because they're more of a wealthy neighborhood. And when that community puts a tiff in, then there are real losers. So this is kind of, you know, uh, the, school, the school superintendents now across the state are coming into this fight. And in fact, in uh, Village of Oak Park, they tried to gin a tiff up and the, the school board there sued <laughs> the, the city. All right, and they spent six hundred thousand yeah. dollars fighting this, and the taxpayer was on both sides of the, of the lawsuit. So, how many after-school programs could six hundred thousand dollars have spent, you know, paid for? Uh, and the end of the day, the TIF was allowed to go through. The city uh, made uh, goods somewhat under the table to the to the school district, but not quite. And the TIF continues, but we're you know the the, the good people of Village of Oak Park are are down six hundred thousand. <laughs> Okay, we have time for a couple more questions, but I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, in North Lawndale, we don't have a comprehensive plan. You know, it's, I guess, inner city sprawl. We won't call it urban sprawl. But, you know, it's like whatever developer of the day comes to the alderman and says, you know, we want this, we want that, and they just put it somewhere. But they don't have a comprehensive plan, and they haven't married that to the TIF. I, I believe that if Chicago would have a comprehensive plan that would drill down to the community level and then use TIF as one of the tools, not, not the tool, to actually support the implementation, that might help. But, you know, that's another conversation. And I will call Sarah, Sarah Simmons. Are you here? Okay, you want to read your question or you want to come here and ask? Boeing Corporation, which is the second largest weapons manufacturer in the world, is uh, in a TIF district in Chicago. And they make drones for spying and for bombing civilians in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So my question is, is it fair to say that Chicago is paying more than its share for the wars there, and our school district is having a budget crisis? I wonder if you guys have any comments about that. Uh, you know, I tend to blame TIFs for everything. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to hold back on blaming them from the war in Afghanistan. Um, uh, but but that, that second point uh, is really critical in terms of the TIF program alone. And, and that is the impact that uh, the TIF program has on public education financing. Um, and that is an exceedingly complicated uh, story. As uh, uh, Professor Dye was saying, it has an impact on the state dis distribution of uh, education funds. Um, but to me, it's one of the most uh, egregious scams. It's the only word I use, and I will continue to use it. Because uh, as the previous speaker asked the question was alluding to, we supposedly have a limit. Uh, every year on the amount that we could tax the property taxpayers uh, to pay for education. And the state passed a law limiting what they call the levy, which is the amount that we spend on any government spends. And we limit it to a certain percentage or the cost of living. I forget what it is exactly. Maybe let's say it's 3%. So that one year it cannot be 3% higher than the other. And so every year we go through this um, the charade where whoever the mayor is and whoever the head of Chicago Public Schools is will tell us, because we believe so much in education, we're going to raise the levy as much as we possibly can raise it. All right, well, what they don't tell you is that there's this TIF surcharge on top of the amount that they're raising, that every time they raise their levy, they're also increasing the amount of money that goes into the TIFs. So you're spending the increased and then you're going beyond it. So it's a way of circumventing the law that's supposed to protect the property taxpayers from excess spending. It's a way to get around that cap. Isn't Hidden that taxes. Hidden taxes. That's absolutely correct. So when I, owe, when I talk to aldermen, the few you know that will have a conversation with me on this subject, <laughs> they'll say, Ben, 
you're wrong about TIFFs. They really, the schools are getting the full amount that they, we can give them because of that levy. We can't give them an extra nickel. And so you really can't say you're diverting money from the schools. To which I always say, oh, somehow or other, you've got this cockamamie scam going that enables you to take money that people pay believing it's going to education and divert it to a slush fund. And somehow or other, you're willing to live with that at the same time that your schools are, what, a billion dollars in debt or whatever manufactured number they've come up with at the moment, at the same time you say you have to close the schools, why don't you just go change the law? So if you're going to exceed the cap, if you're going to exceed the levy, why don't you exceed it in such a way that you could spend the money on education, which I think most people in Chicago would rather have their tax dollars going to education than going to the mayor's slush fund. So I just think that it's just all part of what's wrong with the program, that we have a justification for taking money in the name of education and using that money for things that have nothing to do with education while your public schools are a billion dollars in debt. And you, you could do that, I mean, politically. If you were to end TIF, you could say, and we will give half back to the taxpayers and half to the schools. Uh, and by voting an increase, uh, authority to increase the levy over the, over the tax cap. I would just say, again, the question that I, I want to put to us is, you know, what is your imagined future for the city of Chicago? I mean, because it comes back to that, is what is your vision for a great city? You know, what does a world-class city look like to you? Would you take that billion dollars sitting in the TIF funds and extend the red line to Pullman? or the blue line into the suburbs where the jobs are? Would you double the number of libraries? Would you, I mean, where's the conversation, you know, about the daring vision for the future of the city that we could get behind? And I wouldn't mind spending more money for doubling the number of parks or what have you, you know what I'm saying? So we're kind of, we, we kind of get, get the story told to us. It gets pushed down on us. We fought the Olympics because we were told that was gonna make the sh Chicago a world-class city and we resisted that notion because you can't be a world-class city if only half your kids graduate from high school and they're getting shot to pieces all the time. That you can't be a world-class city. So what is, what is your vision of a world-class city is kind of what I'm, I'm wondering. 